Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth installment of our Trade-Centric University Masterclass Series, Understanding B2B Supplier E-Commerce Maturity and Digital Success. Before we begin, I'd like to cover some housekeeping items for the session. As a reminder, you will be on mute for the duration of this session. We, have, we will have Q&A at the end of the session. Please submit your questions in the question tab at the bottom of the screen and we'll do our best to answer your question. If we don't get to your question during the webinar, a trade-centric representative will reach out to provide an answer. Today, our host is Tom Roberts, Chief Marketing Officer at TradeCentric. He'll be joined by Shay Anglin, Senior Manager of B2B e-commerce, and Rob Richardson, Senior Digital Product Manager for Miller Null. In this session, you will learn perspective on the pivotal role e-commerce and Pudge Shout play in successfully implementing B2B connected commerce, tips for overcoming challenges to achieve B2B connected commerce and generate true ROI, best practices for doing B2B connective commerce right each time. And now I will pass it over to our host, Tom Roberts. Thanks so much, Melissa. I appreciate it. Um, let's go to the next slide. So welcome, everybody. My name is Tom Roberts. Um, I am Chief Marketing Officer for TradeCentric. I've been here for almost precisely a year and three quarters. I joined in December of 21. When I joined, it was still punch out to go. So um, if you don't like the name Trade Centric, you can send me email. If you like it and like what we've done, you can thank all my um, August colleagues. So um, I'm going to ask Shay and Rob to introduce themselves a little bit about uh, what their roles are at Miller Knoll. So Shay, you want to start with you? Sure. Thank you, Tom. I'm Shay Anglin, um, and I am Miller Knoll Senior E-Business uh, Manager, e-commerce, and um, been with Miller Knoll, formerly Herman Miller, for about 17 and a half years. And Throughout my tenure, I have strictly focused on e-commerce in addition to a couple of other hats I've worn, um, but mainly e-commerce. And today I lead Miller Knowles B2B e-commerce team, and we're responsible for B2B e-commerce channel growth, P&L growth. And we focus on customer solutions consulting, customer onboarding, and account management. Awesome. Great. Looking forward to talking uh, a little later. And then Rob, you wouldn't yes. mind? Hi, Tom. Uh, thank, you. thank you for having us. I'm Rob Richardson. Uh, I'm Senior Digital Product Manager at Miller Knoll. Work very closely with Shay and her business team. I also work closely with the technical team and product team that help manage our platform. I've been with Miller Knoll for over 25 years. Most of that time has been in a technology role. I also helped launch our first you know, B2C site that we had for our one of our brands, uh, Herman Miller, uh, a number of years ago. And I've been working uh, side by side with Shay now on our B2B program for the past eight years. Awesome. Great. Well, I really appreciate you guys spending time with us in Miller Knoll. Um, incredible brand, brands, now one brand. So looking forward to sort of having you guys share some insights as we go through really the, the insights in the study that we just published with DC360. So I'll describe that on the next slide um, and kind of go through what the study looks like. So we came up with the idea that we wanted to um, look at a couple of different things, specifically around supplier, B2B suppliers in the US and team with Digital Commerce 360 starting in the beginning of the year to really construct a survey that we fielded in late spring of this year. So it's all fresh, fresh data. We had more than 120 respondents, actually it's 123. They're all B2B companies with B2B e-commerce in either distribution or manufacturing. And they range in revenue sizes across a number of different ranges. So small, medium and large, a very good sort of cross-section across each of those, and then also quite a number of different industries. And as I mentioned, while we do business and Miller Dole does business, and many of you probably do business in Europe and other parts of the world, we concentrated this really in, this says North America, it's really US and Canada with an overriding number of um, respondents in the US. So our objectives were better to understand a number of things around supplier e-commerce. One, 
How is it growing, given the uncertainty in the market overall in terms of interest rate changes and other economic headwinds? Secondly, if you're f investing, which everyone is, where are your focuses for investment? Where are people on what we call the digital maturity curve? And I'll get into that. That's something that we were very interested in sort of mapping out. Um, and then also cross-tabbing that with longevity. How long have they been involved in B2B commerce? And then also talking to folks and trying to collect information from them about their customer buying habits and any changes in that. So we'll go through that as well. So there are going to be three key takeaways. Um, and we'll dig into a lot more than this. But the key three, ta three key takeaways are that despite the Fed trying to cool the economy and reduce inflation really for the last almost year and a half, and the economic uncertainty that's sort of arisen from that, it's sort of abating. But if you look at the, the survey was done in this spring, we asked about the prior 12 months, e-commerce growth was very strong. And we'll give you the statistics on that in a second despite economic uncertainty. Generally, that, that our channel that we're all involved in is um, growing healthily. Also, and it's somewhat surprising, um, there, we'll do a, a map of longevity. How long have people been um, involved in B2B commerce in particular, but then where are they in their maturity? We'll kind of map that out because we, we, uh, we hope to be able to do this study you know, once a year or so and sort of watch how that changes over time, hopefully people are, and, and companies are evolving in their overall maturity. So we've got five different maturity buckets that we'll go through. And then also that B2B buyers are changing their purchasing habits as, um, as more and more companies have implemented e-procurement on the customer side of things, their demands for how they interact with B2B suppliers and B2B commerce is changing. Some suppliers in the survey were responding, some are not, and choosing choosing to sort of not respond. So we'll talk about that and some competitive dynamics that that goes into or presents. So let's dig into the actual survey itself and some of the data. So this is about how long have you been operating a B2B e-commerce site? And despite years of this, you know, and Shay will tell you that she's been involved in this for, I think, 17 and a half years, right, Shay? So quite a while. You've got a mix of these 125 firms or so across um, the spectrum on one to two years, 10%, three to three to five years is 40%. And that's really probably all pandemic driven because you couldn't go out and meet with people and you had to do business, keep doing business. So that's that's pandemic driven. You think about three years, we're right on three to four years into that cycle, six to 10, 30%, and then 20% like Miller Knoll or Miller, Herman Miller. 10 plus years. You'll note, for those of you who took high school statistics, a lot of what we're going to go through, not all of it, but some of it, a decent sample of it, does look like a normal distribution. So if you think about a bell curve or normal distribution, this isn't a perfect one, but it's very, very aligned with a normal distribution. So Shay, I know you guys have been involved for quite a while do you have any commentary on your journey in history, specifically in the B2B side? Rob mentioned B2C, but B2B commerce. Well, I do have a lot to say on that topic. Um, so I can say that I, when I joined Herman Miller in, let's see, 2006, I had joined a team of established, uh, you know, an established e-commerce team. We had, um, as an organization, a B2B platform that had been um, in use for quite some time. I believe it launched somewhere around 1999. Um, so... You know, I kind of look at us being, you know, a furniture manufacturer, furniture supplier, sort of being a pioneer, right, in B2B e-commerce. And when I joined in 2006, we were already integrated. Um, we were already, you know, working with clients and I was working with um, clients to onboard for, you know, integrated punch out sites at that point. And the platform that we had at the time was a, a homegrown platform, so to speak. You know, um, one of our developers had developed it. It was great for what it was at the time, but you know, by the time I joined, it was clear 
um, that we really needed to start thinking about, you know, the next step in our, in our journey. And we needed that we needed to know, we know, we knew at that time that we needed to be able to onboard more customers. We needed more capabilities. And with the internal resources that we had, we were challenged because we were managing everything in house, including our integrations. Somewhere along the line, um, probably back around 2011, I met Brady Berman at a uh, conference, an Ariba conference, actually, uh, Ariba Live. And I had an opportunity to meet him and learned about Punch Out to Go and punch out to go, you know, capabilities. And I thought to myself, this is exactly, you know, what we need, what we can benefit from. And then years later, when we finally got around to replatforming in 2015, um, we had an opportunity to engage with punch out to go and we changed our our plan and we decided to partner and you know outsource the integration piece which brought us significant <laughs> uh benefits um i must say and then you know from there things have only gone up have only gotten better um we've been able to you know onboard quicker our integrations have been smoother and we're at another point now where we're, you know, replatforming again. And because of the relationship we have now with Trade Centric, formerly Punch Out to Go, um, you know, we have this great resource, you know, as we start thinking about what our our next, you know, uh, platform looks like and what our capabilities are going to be. We've we've had great experience in working with Trade Centric to help us help guide help provide guidance and um, best in class you know features and processes and things like that. So it's been a pretty pretty long and pretty amazing journey. Awesome! Thanks so much. Um, let's go to the next slide and talk about just climate in terms of revenue growth. So we asked folks over the last twelve months. How much is your e-commerce and B2B, again, because some of our respondents are also like a Miller and Ole, both do B2C as well as B2B. How much is your B2B commerce growth uh, revenue grown over the last 12 months? And this is interesting, like 86% responded that, okay, we're all growing anywhere from one to 10% for 25% of the respondents. And then really a full on 60% or all in double digit growth. And some very small numbers are flat to down, 8% flat to down, 2% are unsure. So what I mentioned at the beginning on the key takeaway is that despite the jittery economic climate and the other things that we've sort of seen in headwinds for inflation and then interest rate increases and some other things, Obviously, the B2B commerce channel is, remains exceptionally healthy um, and is continuing to grow. So I guess, Rob and Shay, I'll start with Shay just quickly. Um, can you come on and kind of where you guys are here? And then I'll, I have a follow-up question for Rob on this one. Sure. I mean, I will, I can confidently say that we have consistently even if I look outside the last 12 months, we've consistently seen um, a trend, a growth trend. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that having connected commerce has, has really given us the ability to grow and we've seen that consistently. And then Rob, you're, you've been there for a while. Did this, what was the picture? I'm just curious about the picture that you guys saw during the pandemic. I mean, because you're in the furniture business and it's particularly the office furniture business. Was that a challenging time for you guys? And then how did commerce work it work around that uh, piece of the world during sort of the, the you know 2021 period when we're really in the midst of the pandemic? Well, historically, for not just us, for anybody in the office furniture industry, uh, whenever there is a downturn, especially as it affects uh, the, the broader business community, it does affect our business. Uh, and it affected our, our B2B business as well, too. 
But I want to say just to build on what Shay had is that because we've had such great momentum over the years, and yeah, while we did have a bit of a downturn, the strength that we had and the connection that we had with our customers uh, really allowed us to to kick back very quickly. Uh, we've we've grown even more since since the pandemic, uh, even before it, and uh, we're we're looking for continued growth there. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that we've stayed connected and we've we've presented this program to make it easier for our customers to work with us. Yeah, when we went, I was I was at a different company when that all that happened, and I now remember. I didn't remember when we were chatting earlier. One of the first things I did when we started going into lockdown was go to my office and steal my Herman Miller chair. <laughs> Brought it home. <laughs> so I sat there for months in that thing. It was very helpful. All right. So the next slide, I think, was one of the more shocking ones to me because we asked a question like, okay, this is a, you can, you have multiple choice. You can, you can click all the ones that matter to you. We basically asked the question, which of the following channels do you currently do business in from an overall B2B commerce perspective. What was surprising to me, although it probably should not be, because our client advisory board members, of which you guys are one and, and others have all said, okay, yes, there is a there are a lot of channels that we have to support. So this, if you look at it, is amazing. You've got 59% saying, yes, we're doing business through Amazon or Walmart or marketplaces. My e-commerce channel is, you know, 57%, which is not far behind. But then the ones that I find still quite interesting are call center and customer service at 56%, sales rep, 51%, not really surprising, but then also email or fax or manual, almost 25% of the population. So this made me feel for all you all because this is a lot of things to support. And, um, and I, you know, I have worked in a big couple of big call center businesses, you know, that's, there's, that's a lot of call center technology that's sort of advancing, to keep you off the phone, which kind of mad, makes me angry when I try to get to somebody, but then also there's a lot of cost in human capital. So I guess, Shay, Rob, you you know, from a channel perspective, do you guys have concepts and perspective on the number of channels that you guys are supporting and how that may be shifting over time and what you're trying to do in terms of trying to contain these? Well, I'll jump in first and say, um, you know, really a lot of these, these areas on the screen uh, as, a, as a corporation, we've We've checked the, many of these boxes uh, outside of our our electronic capabilities, our B two B e commerce business. We we do have sales representatives out in the field, and uh, what I could call still analog uh, processes that a lot of the salespeople and customers enjoy that that face to face contact and other things. We do know that uh, again, just to even stem off of what we talked about before. Having these uh, the personalized e-commerce capability, the punch out capability for our customers has, has really uh, not only strengthened our relationship with them, but there's a lot of demand out there for that type of service, that type of connection, especially for, you know, sometimes the larger, uh, larger sales that we do with these customers and, and provides them a level of confidence. But for sure, we we have a lot of these things that we still have in place, uh, even customer service uh, capability too, directly with our dealers and our customers to reach out to us. But you know, having those personalized e-commerce websites has really has really been golden, and we see so much exponential growth in the future in that context. So Shay, I think, and I, you just mentioned it, uh, Rob. You guys have a, a pretty important dealership network too, and I'm sorry I may be putting you on the spot. Can you talk a little bit about how your dealers also work within the context of your e-commerce strategy to support your larger customers? Sure. So, yes, I think that's um, an important thing to know about our business specifically is that the B2B um, piece of our business, you know, we sell through authorized dealerships globally. And, you know, our role is to help support them. Right. So our program, our e-commerce program, we are, you know, working with our dealers to help them make it easier to do business with customers, you know, between dealer customer. Um, and I will say that, you know, we <laughs> I've seen many things. Um, our dealers vary, you know, in terms of size and capability. So some of them are actually selling through marketplaces, 
um, not all, but some. Um, they all have, you know, dedicated sales representatives and they are still doing manual, um, you know, transactions. And not as many as I would like are, you know, engaging with us, um, but that's changing quickly, you know, as we see the demand grow. So um, I'm not really hearing much about mobile app for the type of commodity that we sell because it's, you know, configurable furniture. And um, yeah, so, you know, I would say a majority of these, I, I would say. Got it. Okay. All right. Uh, you guys mentioned platform upgrade. That's what we're going to talk about on the next slide. We, we asked our respondents, okay, how are you thinking about your platform, you know, upgrading existing or switching? Um, we know that there was a lot of platform switching and movement, you know, in 19, 20, 21, even in 18, there was a lot of progress, a lot of move and evolution on platform switching. We know from our customers and we know also from because we are partners with a lot of platform companies, e-commerce platform companies, that that sort of movement is down. And you can see at the far right, I'll go to the far right of this um, chart that 33% of respondents said, okay, I'm, it's a top priority for me to change platforms and it's got budget. Doesn't mean I'm doing it right now because a platform switch is a big deal. 41%, hey, it's a top priority. I'd love to switch, but I have no budget. I don't have the budget for it. Or, And then 26% is not a priority. Upgrading existing platforms, 63%. Yep, I got to upgrade and I've got the budget to do it. So that's the far and away winner here. 34% saying it's a priority, but I don't have the budget. Um, we'll talk about uh, the second one in a second. And then back office systems and upgrading and enhancing connections to back office systems is also a pretty hefty 46%. So we'll talk about e-procurement projections, uh, connections in a second. But um, you guys both, I think, said that you're going through a platform change. I know you don't want to talk about from X to Y, but Shay, you want to talk a little bit about your journey there and um, why you're why you're moving in that direction? Sure. Um, so for us, it's it's really comes boils down to you know, meeting our customers where they're at and, you know, they're, ch they're changing buying behaviors. Um, there's expectations, right. For capabilities. And, you know, we had a pretty decent platform, but when we really thought about long-term strategy and our ability to grow and scale, it just wasn't the right fit. And we started to think about, you know, what does that future look like? What is going to take, what is it going to take for us to get there? And we realized that, you know, it was time we needed to make a change. Okay. And then Rob, you guys have, are pretty focused on, Shay just mentioned changing buyer behavior and other things and mentioned a little, a little bit before about integrations, very focused on your larger customers, supporting them where they're where their buying behavior is changing to e-procurement system and demands to connect that to commerce. You want to talk about that uh, second set of bars here, the 46% say it's a top priority and I've got the budget and how, what your perspective is on that and your experience. Yeah. I mean, one of the things we did with the current, uh, current platform is we tried to find the best fit for being agile within the concept of what, uh, our our general community of B2B e-commerce buyers needed. And it wasn't just the offering on the site, but also the data information that we could exchange back and forth. And so in many ways, we've done a very good job. In some ways, we've had to customize a few things, especially for some of our larger customers who had some very unique demands. And so with the new platform as well, too, that we've talked about, we've taken into account some of those customizations we've had to do and try and fold that into the new platform and its broader capabilities and also increase some agility on product offering and catalogs and other things like that. So we've taken what we've learned and and prepped us for the future on that. So while it was a you know it was a little stop and have to build and, and then continue forward, uh, we're we're gonna be uh, running more of economies of scale in the future with with where our plans are going. Okay, awesome. 
All right. In the beginning of this, I mentioned that we did ask, and one of the objectives was to ask not just how long have you been offering e-commerce, B2B commerce, but then also where are you on the maturity curve? We're going to get in self-described maturity, although it gave people uh, categories to put themselves into. And that's what we're going to get to on the next slide. So we basically mapped out five different sort of levels of maturity. And similarly, I said, if you turn a, a normal distribution on its side, this is again, almost a normal distribution, not quite perfect at all, but but close. So e-commerce 1.0, and I'll just read through these because it's, it, it you know, we, and just to be clear, we, Trade Centric, came up with these, uh, but it did allow our respondents to slot themselves in one of five different categories. So the first one is, hey, I've invested in e-commerce and I'm trying to migrate customers from manual ordering as much as possible. So 20% of respondents said, I'm still in e-com 1.0. E-commerce 2.0, I fully adopted my e-commerce site, but I don't have the customization that my buyers are looking for around things like negotiated price or specific inventory levels or other sorts of delivery timeframes that they may have, may, have, um, may have negotiated. It's kind of one size fits all. The vast majority of respondents said they're in e-commerce 3.0, which is we've kind of made e-commerce the primary ordering channel. But like we saw in that earlier slide, a lot of other channels, including EDI, are also quite prominent. So that's 28% of respondents, which by far is the, is the largest percentage. E-commerce 4.0 is, hey, I am recognizing some of my buyers have invested in e-procurement and I'm connecting to some of them, but I'm also supporting other things like hosted catalogs, et cetera. So I'm struggling. We have customers like this struggling to kind of figure out how to move more of my customers uh, into that sort of world. And the final one, Ecom 5.0 or connected commerce. I've got fully integration, full integration with my biggest customers who've got e-procurement solutions like Coupa, like you mentioned Jagger, you mentioned SAP Ariba. Um, Birch Street, et cetera. So, and I've got not just punch out from e procurement, but also PO, invoice, and other types of automation. So that's 17% of the population, whereas Ecom 4.0 is about 18%. So 35% of the population in those final two buckets versus about 37% in the first two buckets. So I know you guys have traveled this journey um, quite a bit and kind of gone through it. And Shay, you said, you know, it sounds like Mil Herman Miller started on this quite early. I assume you would put yourself in e-commerce 5.0 or connected commerce, given your given your program. You want to comment on that a little bit and what you've learned about that? Yeah, so I would say you're exactly right. Um, today and for a while, we've, we've been at 5.0 connected commerce. Um, for us, you know, I think of it as a no brainer. Um, really, it, it's really the only way for us to really, um, you know, significantly grow our business. And so, you know, that has shown and, you know, our leadership, we're very grateful to have, you know, leadership that supports this initiative and sees the value um, and which is why we've been able to, you know, continually think about, right, investing in our, in our program and our platform. And so, you know, I can't think about going backwards. I mean, it's only forwards. And right now it's punch out PO invoice automation and, you know, every day, even though I've been doing this for 17 and a half years, I'm still learning new things. <laughs> There's always something. So. Got it. And I think, Rob, you've told me that probably when you guys were back traveling through Ecom 3.0, that you were doing integrations to customers on your own DIY. You want to talk a little bit about that experience and then um, what you learned from that? Yeah, I mean, the, the key thing here is, especially even with the longevity that we've had, we've grown with our customers as we've gone along. One of the key things was, is that, yes, we did manual uh, punch out and PO connections. 
And while those did work, it required a lot of dedicated resources, dedicated time, and also maintenance and, and upgrades later on down the line. So, uh, you know, we, we eventually realized the necessity, right, to have more efficiency with some of those things. So we we integrated with um, with having the, the middle capability of having a, uh, a e-commerce punch out integrator to help us. And the other thing, too, is it's not just having all of those, uh, I would say, the manual accounting aspects of e-procurement that, that's required, right, to be able to grab products, bring them back and, and to purchase them. The one thing we've also realized that's that's not on the connected piece here, too, on your slide is communication. Communication is so key, not only just to set up this these channels with them, but also to have the ability to communicate with them. So the efforts we've made to provide something more, uh, what we would say more efficient with a service provider to help us with those e-procurement connections. Uh, the other key thing too, is we saw the need to grow with our customers to communicate more. And so while we're, we're, we have punch out and purchase order and off invoice automation today, we also have added uh, details in there too, to have clear and uh, connected communications between us, our customers and our dealers so that they can stay connected along this journey and uh, it's really shown to be great. Are you putting a plug in for your advanced messaging? I am. Yeah. I am. I'm very yeah. proud of it. That's an apple that I like to shine. So. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. All right. Thanks, you guys. So I just want everyone to sort of focus on this last back to the data. Most people in 3.0, uh, 28%. But then if you add 4.0 and connected commerce here, that's about 35% of the population doing something with or a lot with e-procurement integrations to respond to customers. That's relevant when we get to this next slide, which we ask question, we ask all the respondents, hey, how many of your customers are asking for e-procurement integrations? Um, what was surprising is that 61% of the respondents said 20%, really 21% or more of their customers are asking for e-procurement integration. So large numbers. Um, and that was surprising, which means there is demand from customers to respond. But if we go back and don't go back to the other slide, but there are only 35% of respondents were actually responding. So 61%, hey, my customers are asking me about this. 35% are doing something about it, which means there's a decent percentage which are rolling the dice and not taking action either because of budget or technology concerns, or um, some other some other sets of things. So, um, Shay, I mean, I, I I'm curious about your perspective on this, and in particular, this is inbound requests from customers. We also work with folks like you guys, although you have a very sophisticated program about how you're not just waiting for inbound requests; you're also really asking and proactively working with customers, and that takes education of your sales team. Um, do you have any concept or thoughts on that? Yeah, so from our from our model, I guess you could say, um, it's really our dealers, our dealer sales folks, and our Miller Knoll uh, sales folks that have that direct line with customers. And so, for myself, Rob, and our team. Um, you know, we're, we're really in a position where, you know, they call on us and think of us as sort of the, you know, the experts, right? And so when there's a need, um, you know, they sort of reach out and engage. Um, I think that we have worked very hard to, you know, provide the information and the education um, to our dealerships and our internal sales folks, and we're continuing to work on that to make sure that they're well versed to understand, you know, that we have these capabilities to offer our clients. So when conversations do come up, they're able to speak to it. Um, so in terms of understanding the percentage of customers who ask, I really wouldn't have visibility to that just because of the the situation that we're in. But what I can tell you is from my lens and what I've seen um, is that 
it is a requirement to do business with many of the organizations that we we sell to. And it's no longer a nice to have, it's a must have. If we want to engage and we want to sell to a particular organization, this is just something we have to do. And Rob, I mean, there's a lot of procurement applications out there. There must be a technical aspect on trying to figure out how to support those. And and you also mentioned data and analytics. You want to comment a little bit about that with that this much customer demand, how, how you think about that and how you guys um, frame that type of opportunity, if you will? Yeah. And one, one thing to point out too, and one thing that's a benefit for us in our organization is the combination of Shay and I on how we, we work together on this program where um, Shay definitely has that connection on the business side. I keep them keep and maintain the tech, uh, the technical side of things. And we, we kind of meet together in that. And so, yeah, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of aspects with um, how to deal with the technology side of things. We definitely have some microservices that we use. Uh, we 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 use Trade Centric for our our intermediary for our e procurement pieces. And there's there's a lot of pieces that, like we said before, that we've had to customize for our customers. So there's a lot of a uh, lot of things that have to be interconnected, and we work really hard to make those as absolutely seamless as possible for our customers so that when they when they punch out to our site and they're getting to their unique site and, and the content is unique for them, the data that they need behind the scenes too from their accounting perspective in order to go through their purchasing process. We want to make that as seamless as possible for them too. That takes some work. Uh, but the, as we work through this program over the years, we've, we've definitely found efficiencies that we're using. And for more, for the most part, too, part of the reason why we are replatforming is to make sure that we can be as agile as possible with some of those key aspects and the, the key demands and requirements that our customers have with our connection with them to be able to bring on more customers and to make that journey a lot easier for them, too, if our customers have to change. So those are all aspects that we have to stay connected with. And Shay and I do a really great job of understanding that demand and the needs from the customers. And she comes to me with those. And we review those and make sure, yep, this is what we, we have today. Here's where we have to make some adjustments. And we do all that legwork to make a really great experience for our customers. And so hopefully we, we think we do a pretty good job of that for them. Uh, they've told us this, uh, that too, uh, directly. And, you know, with, on the analytics side of things too, we, we really track our sales. We track how the volume works from month to month. Um, we look at what's not in the numbers as well too. Like, what are we not seeing that we've seen before or vice versa that also indicate maybe there might be some friction somewhere along that workflow pattern for our customers. And we try and be as proactive as we can to reach out and, and check in with them. That's because, you know, just like with anybody, uh, life happens. And so uh, business life happens too. There's changes and we try and uh, be there for them and work with them as they change. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, appreciate all the insight, you guys. So I think it's time for us now to go to Q&A. And I think my trusty assistant, Melissa, is going to help us tee up some questions that we've gotten. So, Melissa? Yes. Um, so, Tom, what range of industries were used for this survey? Well, that's a good question. And it's uh, I would reframe the question a little bit. It's not so much used which ones responded because we really did not um we didn't kind of bunk it into into one industry or, or try to avoid things but basically there's at least and that, and broadly it was all manufacturing and distribution but there are sub segments within those so it business products and services uh, industrial goods manufacturing uh life sciences is big consumer products food and beverage, computer and electronic solutions. Um, so marketing and advertising. So it's a very broad cross-section of industries and not an overwhelming sort of big chunk that would sway this in, in any one of them. So a very good sort of cross-section of, I'd say, manufacturing and distribution across the U.S. economy. 
Okay, great. Um, Shay, next questions for you. Can you explain more about the benefits of moving from e-commerce 3.0 to connective commerce? Yeah, so for me, when I think about the benefits, there are three main benefits. One is growth, sales, increased sales. Two is deepen customer relationships. And the third would be an increase in opportunities. So in terms of increased sales, you know, the way I look at it and from what I'm seeing um, and the clients that I've had the pleasure of working with, you know, I mentioned before, it's it's pretty much a requirement to do business with a lot of these organizations. Many organizations across different industries are investing in e-procurement platforms and they have a very, very um, vested interest in working with suppliers who can support that initiative. And so, you know, nine times out of 10, if I see an RFP um, that's coming through, many times RFPs are starting or have been not starting um, to, you know, require e-commerce to like capabilities RFIs are, you know, positioned around questions about manufacturer um, capabilities. So for us, we've seen that by, you know, providing these capabilities to our customers, it's allowed us to grow our business. We've seen, you know, growth and we can project that, you know, with the right resources and investment. Um you know, we can certainly um, increase our growth even further. And, you know, it takes a lot to onboard. You know, when we're thinking about, you know, in our business, we're developing um, personalized punch out catalogs, right? Because our commodity is configurable custom furniture. So, you know, when we're working with a client, to onboard them, you know, we're curating a catalog with their products that they're purchasing, their pricing, their contract pricing. And, you know, there's time effort that goes into that from the client's perspective, from their side, from our side, then you, you know, factor in integration, testing, launch, you know, it it's definitely a commitment. And, you know, I definitely have seen that if we as a manufacturer supplier are willing to make that commitment with a customer, we will see customer loyalty. That customer is less likely to leave us because we have that deepened connection. We have that, you know, that relationship. And a lot of times that deepened relationship leads to increased opportunities. So, you know, we have in, in our world, you know, a lot of our business comes from projects or even day two type scenarios. And because we have these established relationships with these clients, they're more likely to include us in these larger project opportunities for new business, or they're more likely to include us in their next round of you know, contract negotiations or RFPs. So we have seen new business through these increased opportunities just from having those connections as well. Understood. Thanks, Shay. Um, Rob, the next question came in for you. Um, can you talk to the biggest benefit you've seen since offering full end-to-end -end integration? Really, it's assurance in the eyes of our customers. Um, being able to offer the level of service that we we do is not only required but by our customers, but it goes beyond that. Um, when applied the right way to give them the confidence that there is a fidelity-based, seamless access, checkout, purchasing, and electronic invoicing, is the analogy I like to use is like, it's it's a feeling when you get when you have a best friend help you move. They're literally there for you. They're literally there to help carry the load. And, and this, this relationship is liquid gold for our customers. And it really lets them know that we've got this. Great, thanks. 
Um, and now Shay, back to you. How do you prioritize which customers to start with? Yeah, I think I look at a few things. Um, one being, you know, e-procurement adoption. Um, knowing that, you know, it is an investment of time um, and resources, both on the customer side and our side, you know, I'm looking at where is the customer in their e-procurement journey, right? Are they committed? Have they adopted? Are they, you know, going to drive spend through that platform um you know ideally our clients you know they have e-procurement policies and they're you know the ideal situation is that you know there are requirements for their buyers their internal buyers to only buy from what we call a, a preferred supplier and those are the type, types of um, scenarios that I'm looking for. Additionally, um, of course, opportunity forecast, you know, what does what their um, spend look like? Um, what does their furniture budget look like? And, you know, strategic priority, um, the impact for, you know, broader business relationships, uh, drive share of wallet and et cetera. Great, thanks, Shai. Um, Rob, how do you get internal buy-in to invest in connective commerce? Did you run into any objections from leadership? Well, this could be this could be a tricky one because many people know how B two C eco ecosystems work, but initially, people don't necessarily understand the full complexities of B two B. We found it is very critical that more than ever to have dedicated upfront communications with their leadership to help them best understand not only the differences, but key support activities that are absolutely vital for the health of our program. We mentioned this earlier. Earlier on uh, in our program, we manually set up and maintained all of our e-procurement routing ourselves, which also involved trying to keep up with all the periodic customer changes, connectivity changes, and e-procurement software changes and upgrades. Discussions to move to a service provider helped us handle, to help us handle these complexities was, was challenging, right? Because just trying to understand the necessity for it. Through some thoughtful dedication uh, on the topic, we received the funding to initiate that relationship and stayed in contact with key people. So it wasn't just asking for the money and running. We stayed in contact with them to show them that and report back to them the resulting benefits for us. For instance, you know, just saving in resource time and dollars directly to manually do all that work. And the fidelity, it also added for our customers, right? Uh, and that made the investment uh, post factum no brainer, right? This also resulted in taking those dedicated resources that all they were doing was doing manually procurement connections and allow them to fo fo help focus more on our agile development to increase the perpetual and progressive improvements we were trying to do on the platform offering. And hey, you know what? That made everybody smile, myself included, because uh, we, we have a great partner to do that but also we were putting our resources where they really needed to be. And that was to help our program grow. Great. Um, this next question is really for any of the one of three of you, um, but what are emerging trends you are seeing with B2B commerce? commerce? I'll let you guys go first on that, but well, I'll let you guys go first. I'll turn to Shay first. Sure. <laughs> um, so I, gosh, there's a few. So um, I guess I'll start with, you know, the trend that I'm seeing is that we're noticing e-procurement um, adoption more and more in healthcare. Um, you know, in my experience, you know, higher education, early adopters, um, even, you know, national global accounts, you know, pretty much early adopters, but healthcare has been sort of, in my view, a little bit slower to adopt to, you know, making that leap. And so I'm starting to see that change. I'm starting to see more and more interest and more and more 
uh, leads for, you know, large hospital organizations that are looking to partner with manufacturers that have these capabilities. So that's one trend. Um, another trend I'm seeing is that we, so I mentioned, you know, we have clients that I onboarded 17 years ago that are still clients on our e-procurement system. We're fully integrated. We're seeing these clients that we've had this long-term relationship with are now sort of looking at their investments and they're looking to improve and they're looking to further streamline their business processes. And so another trend I'm seeing is clients that are, you know, coming back to us and saying, okay, we really, you know, we really like what we have here, but we want to add, you know, a few other capabilities. We want to add things like electronic invoicing, CXML invoicing, um, level two search, that has come up in many conversations recently, level two search. So there's, you know, more capabilities. Um, and, you know, it, it's something that we are hearing from our clients, we're, we're listening, we're taking in. And, you know, as Rob mentioned, the two of us, we discuss it. And, you know, a lot of times we're creating a roadmap, right, of the things that we're hearing and seeing. Um, so those are just a few examples of some of the trends that I'm seeing. So I'll, I'll go next. I mean, one of the things that, you know, if you go to e-commerce conferences and whatnot, you see there's a lot of talk about headless and mm -hmm. PI first and other things. And we are seeing adoption of that because then it affects us, right? Especially if we have an existing client that moves or a client that then wants to connect with their customers. We 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 have to understand it. But we still see that as as it's it's in its earlier days, even though that is the talk of the town, so much to speak, but um it's it's not as prevalent in the installed base movement, sort of as you saw with platform switching, um, as sort of, I guess you'd you'd come away understanding if you just spent time going to all these conferences. So that's one one trend that we're talking about. Another one, and there's another question in here that I'll switch to, and that's um, that it's interesting that came in while we were talking. We're seeing some of our customers wanting to move away from self-managed ePro connections toward ePro marketplaces that host catalogs and punch outs from many suppliers and then allow their members access to those connections. Do you have any comments around this? I'll start and then it'd be interested in your perspective. We've seen some of that, but it's like, to me, that's another channel channel, and it's like the top channel on that list that we had uh, previously. Some of those that are more specialized in certain verticals, they're actually our customers of ours and we're supporting punch out to their buyers. So we're seeing some of that. And we know mm -hmm. some of our client advisory board members are working on those marketplaces, but not to the exclusion of what they're doing directly. So I'd say that what my experience has been sitting where we sit, it's a bit of a mix. So I don't know if Rob, Shay, you've got perspective on that from your customers and, and your industry in particular. Yeah, I've seen in different flavors of the marketplace type of, um, you know, engagement. And I, you know, in general for our commodity, and the way that we, you know, do business, it's it's not necessarily the best fit um, most of the time. And so we don't tend to engage too much in those types of opportunities right now. Um, and many times the clients that we have that are, you know, moving to those, you know, Amazon marketplace, they're keeping traditional punch out integrations um, for suppliers like us because of the type of commodity that we are selling. So I wouldn't have a lot to say about it, but I am aware and I definitely have been hearing more and more that um, the clients that we have contracts with that we work with are, you know, implementing those types of um, purchasing processes. 
Gotcha. All right. We've got a number of other questions in here, but in the interest of time, I do want to make sure we end on time and be respectful of everybody's time. I'm going to move to um, just the last couple slides. So we always have a tip of the month. Um, the tip of this month is you should, we publish a lot of content. Um, much of it's our own, like this, this, um, or in partnership with somebody like DC 360, like this survey and this research that we just did, but we also do uh, blog posts and other things. And some are from third parties that we asked to help us. So all of that is basically free of charge. We may at times ask you for your email address and your name. Uh, that's about as much as we're going to ask you for. But um, the best way to keep up with that, there's two ways. You can sign up for our newsletter and we'll put that in the chat. There's a link in the chat to sign up for our newsletter. And you can also always follow us on LinkedIn. We're very active on LinkedIn. We're also on Twitter and Facebook, but LinkedIn is our primary social channel. And we merchandise our content quite a bit there. Speaking of content, um, this research report, there's a lot more in it than what we were able to highlight today. And you can go ahead and download it. And um, we will also put a, a link in the chat so you can download. We will ask you, it's available on our website. There's an example. We will ask you for your um, email address and your name, sorry. But you can go ahead and outside of that, it's basically free of charge. And then the final thing that I'll do, my second to last thing I'll do is on the next slide, I'm gonna plug our next Trade Centric University Masterclass, which is hosted by my much better looking and much smarter colleague, Kevin Kazemeyer. Um, if those of you who don't know, Kevin is a uh, e-commerce, B2B commerce and e-pro pro, came from a number of different places prior to us uh, having uh, him join us. So places like Lowe's and Granger and Staples. So he knows his way around this topic very well. So. October 25th at 1 p.m., driving growth and adoption through your procurement. That will be the topic and guest to be announced again, October 25th at 1 p.m. Eastern. So with that, I truly want to say thank you to Shay and Rob and Miller Knoll for donating you guys. Um, you're much more fascinating than I am <laughs> by far. And then I also want to thank all of our attendees uh, for attending. I really appreciate you guys. Go ahead, please. And sign up for our next masterclass and we look forward to seeing you there.